Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Money Show would like to welcome John Buckingham, the editor of The Prudent Speculator. Today, John will provide his insight into what's ahead for investors while offering specific undervalued dividend paying stocks that show signs of promise given today's unique market conditions. So let's go ahead and turn the controls over here to John. And John, we appreciate you being here. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate everybody uh, taking time out of their day to um, participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, the title of the webinar is The Secret to Success in Stocks. And I'm going to give you the answer to that question or that statement here very quickly. But first, um, hopefully everybody is aware of, of who I am. I'm the editor of the Prudent Speculator newsletter. Uh, I've been doing this since 1987. Um, started as a senior in college. I went to work for the great Al Frank. And if uh, folks are familiar with money shows, as hopefully they are, given the, the venue that we're participating in today, um, Al Frank made a lot of appearances at the money shows, and I was fortunate enough to learn at the foot of the great uh, um, value investor. Um, I put these slides on the screen that show, uh, you know, um, that I've actually uh, lost a few uh, hairs over the years. Um, I do like to show the the where the Dow was because the message has been the same. If you look at this the picture on the bottom right, you'll see uh, Dow was 7,500. Um, on the left, it was 18,000, and obviously we're significantly higher today. Um, so, but the message that we um, have uh, live by is that uh, the idea is you buy a broadly diversified portfolio of undervalued stocks and you stick with them through thick and thin, which leads us to the, what the secret of success or secret to success in stocks is, and it's really not to get scared out of them. It's a Peter Lynch quote, but unfortunately, too many investors think they can time the market. Too many investors uh, get uh, nervous about this, that, or the other thing. And unfortunately, it leads them to have subpar investment returns. So in this webinar, we're going to try to give perspective on, on investing, um, talk about why we do what we do. Um, and I think number two in this listing, busting the myths, is perhaps the most important part of the presentation, because there's a lot of things you'll hear on television or online or in the financial press. Um, that sometimes isn't even true, or it, it may sound like it's a, a good idea, but in reality, if you actually look at data and the numbers, um, whatever the commentator might be saying doesn't necessarily hold true um, when you actually look at what's happened with stocks. And then for uh, those who managed to make it uh, with us for the full 45 minutes, uh, we'll give you our investment team put together a, a listing of 25 undervalued dividend-paying stocks. Um, all of which, believe it or not, are yielding more than the 30-year treasury and, in our opinion, have significant appreciation potential. So without further ado, we will talk about uh, perspective. One of my favorite quotes, uh, perhaps my most favorite quote, is this one. If you do not change direction, you may end up where you are heading. Unfortunately, too many people get off the path to achieving their long-term investment success. And the reason they often do that is emotions. Um, one of my favorite uh, individuals on Wall Street, um, most people, if you've read the paper, uh, watch CNBC, you will see this fellow, Peter Tuchman. Uh, Peter is very photogenic. Um, he looks like Einstein. Um, and back uh, in July, when the Dow broke through 27,000, Peter was very excited, and he had his Dow 27,000 hat on. Uh, a few uh, weeks later, uh, there was you know bad news on the trade front, and you can see Peter in the lower part of the screen here. Um, he had actually pulled out all of his hair, or so it seemed, and he was uh, looking like the world had just come to an end. So the emotional part of investing is very difficult for people to uh, deal with. And Mr. Tuchman, who is on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, it seems like the only reason he exists there is to get photographed, and he does a good job of being very expressive for the cameras. Um, but he shows you the highs and lows that come with investing. And the problem these days is that we have immediate access to information. You know, you have your smartphone that will tell you how your portfolio is doing tick by tick. Um, you have the ability to transact via your smartphone. 
and now the great uh, discount brokers, Schwab, Fidelity, and the like, have given us the ability to trade commission-free. You know, I would argue that trading commission-free, while it sounds great in theory, is a, not so great for many investors because it's going to encourage them to trade. And generally speaking, the more you trade, um, the less money you're going to make. There have been studies that would suggest that. And here is a psychological study that I'm showing on this slide, uh, the effect of myopia and loss aversion on risk taking. So again, the people who got more information, more feedback, uh, ended up taking the, the uh, least amount of risk and they earned the least amount of money. And so try to uh, stay away from your phone. Uh, try to let the market be your friend as opposed to, um, you know, your enemy by constantly churning your portfolio. And people will tell me, yeah, but John, I, you know, if only we could avoid the downturns, you know, wouldn't it be great to avoid, uh, you know, the next big 10% uh, decline? Well, believe it or not, in the 42 years we've been publishing the Prudent Speculator newsletter, uh, in 25 of those years, there have been 10% uh, corrections. Um, that seems like an amazing stat, and you can see all the red dots down here showing the declines, including, you know, 20% declines like we had last year in 2018. So volatility is very much normal. You know, if a 10% decline is going to cause you to sell your stocks, um, I would do it today uh, before you have the 10% decline. And to put things even more into perspective, um, just in the last 10 years since the end of the financial crisis, as we're showing on this slide, believe it or not, there have been 35% declines without a comparable move in the opposite direction, 30 of them. Um, and a lot of investors get spooked by a 5% pullback. And you know, again, if the 5% decline is going to cause you to do something rash with your portfolio, um, you better get ready because we're going to have them and in and, and some years we'll have you know, four, five, six of them. Um, it's normal. Uh, volatility is very much normal. The slide I have on the screen now is showing you the 5% declines, 7.5% declines, 10% declines down here, and how often they occur. We have a 10% decline in the market on average every 0 0.9 years, you know, 15% decline every 2.1 years, and a 20% decline every 3.6 years. So bear markets, 20% declines are normal. Uh, and but the good news is that the, we also have increases or rallies of equal or greater magnitude. And happily, the gains that have been generated in those rallies, as you can see here, have dwarfed the losses that have occurred in the downturns. So volatility, as we say, is very much normal. But the reward you get for enduring the volatility is significant um, appreciation of your portfolio over time. Value stocks have returned 13% a year going back to 1927. Growth stocks about 9.5% a year. And dividend payers 10.5% uh, a year. And you can see how that compares to bonds, bills, inflation, and so forth. So stocks have proved very rewarding for people, again, for those who don't get scared out of them. And not surprisingly, we like value and dividend paying stocks because historically they've generated the best returns. But it's not easy. It really isn't easy to deal with the um, sensationalistic uh, media coverage that we now see uh, in the financial press. It's very hard to get taken uh, or get noticed uh, in the press. And so you have to make uh, you know, broad statements, scary statements, sensationalistic statements. So this slide I have up now, um, I was at the Money Show in San Francisco back in August, and we had another one of these big declines and CNBC ran a special report that night. And you know, tonight, fear and uncertainty grip the world markets and everything is spiraling out of control. What can you do to keep your money safe? Everything you need to know, a CNBC special report, markets in turmoil, eight o'clock Eastern tonight. Um, I didn't say that as dramatically as the announcer says it in the commercial that CNBC run, but believe it or not, the picture I have on the screen was not from August of 2019, because that special ran at 7 p.m., not at 8 p.m. This one was actually from August of 2011. So markets have been in turmoil uh, many times, and they'll be in turmoil again. So here you can see 2011. The markets were in turmoil 
in 2010, you can see markets are in turmoil. There's Larry Kudlow. Um, in 2015, markets are in turmoil. But look at where the Dow was. Look at where the S&P 500 was. Um, the moral of the story is we will get through the turmoil. Um, investors need to, again, be always braced for volatility. But uh, it's, again, often very difficult to resist the, the siren call of the financial press that's essentially trying to tell you to do something. And it's not just television. If you're online, um, you'll see plenty of, of uh, advertisements. Um, I thought these were interesting earlier this year. The bear market survival event, perhaps a few of you uh, listened to that because um, it was an online event just like this one is. But back in May, here was something, the coming crash will be far worse than 2008. You know, you could join Jim Rogers and uh, Porter Stansberry for this special uh, webinar or seminar. And then also, just to show you that, uh, you know, the, the hype, if you will, will cut both ways, uh, we had this fellow down here was talking about Dow 50,000. You know, the experts who failed to predict the crash, the housing bust, blah, 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 are now telling you to prepare for a financial crisis. But they're wrong and following their advice will cost you dearly. Well, that seems like two extremes uh, on the overall spectrum. But if you look over here on the right, believe it or not, Mr. Sugarrood, who is this fellow right here, predicting Dow 50,000, and then there's Porter Stansberry, who's telling you the coming crash will be far worse than 2008. They work for the same company, Stansberry Research. And again, I'm not trying to bash Stansbury Research, but their mission is to get you to buy stuff by scaring you or exciting you, playing on your fear and greed. So as I say at the top up here, helping you, no, they're not helping you, they're helping them make money. Because what do you do with this advice from the same organization as telling you that the world's going to end or happy days are here again? So again, you have to be careful about what you read and, and hear online. And, you know, Mr. Sugarood was uh, mentioned Dow 50,000. I think we'll get there. Um, and believe it or not, uh, Dow 50,000 is, is if we just average the returns that the Dow has had uh, historically going forward, if we have the same price return, which historically has been 5.6% per year, and you do the math, you'll get out here to the year 2031, and we will be at Dow 50,000 without anything dramatic. So I think we'll get to Dow 50,000. And, uh, you know, I'd be willing to bet on it that we'll get to Dow 50,000 before we'll get to Dow 5,000, as many uh, uh, pundits, uh, you know, are trying to scare investors with. So try to keep things in perspective. Uh, stocks do pr uh, uh, ha have proved rewarding for those, again, who can navigate the ups and downs, ignore all of the calls from people telling you to bail out of the market. Um, and the way you can do that is obviously, it, it's one thing if I tell you to do it and say, well, here's the historical evidence. But if you actually look at, at data related to many of the claims that are made on by the you know, supposed experts, um, you can really help to mitigate that fear. And as I like this particular quote, fear cannot be banished, but it can be calm and without panic. It can be mitigated by reason and evaluation. And that's what we try to do is present the data. You know, when someone says that the, the sky is green, happily there's data that shows that it's blue. And you don't have to believe that the sky is green just because somebody on TV said it was. So I like to bust myths. Um, there are things that really bug me that I hear on, on television or you know, online or in the newspapers that, again, sometimes aren't true or may be true, but the uh, resulting um, thing you should do with your portfolio does not necessarily follow, at least based on history. So let's take a look at some of the myths that are out there that have caused so many investors to do so poorly over the years um, investing. There is a study that has been done by um, the Dalbar organization and each year they look at investor returns in mutual funds versus the actual returns of those funds. And believe it or not, investors have done very poorly relative to the funds in which they're invested. And it's not just stocks, bonds, it's the same thing. The bond uh, uh, fund investors are nowhere near what the actual indexes do. Same thing with the stock 
uh, fund investors. And it's not just because mutual funds have higher expense ratios. It's generally speaking because investors are lousy market timers. Uh, you know, they want to buy after everything has gone up and they want to sell after everything has gone down. So one of the, the big worries that investors have today is the potential of recession. Um, media, of course, is, is full of stories about how this indicator might uh, suggest that a recession is around the corner. And in theory, right, if, if there's a recession coming, that's bad for the economy. So in theory, that would mean we wouldn't want to own stocks if the economy is going to tank. But when you actually start looking at data, the risk of recession, yes, it has increased. But there's a statistic, the leading economic indicators comes out every month. Uh, the latest um, reading on it was minus 0 0.1, which obviously is below zero, which means that the risk of recession is higher. But it does not suggest that a recession is imminent. We would need to see something substantially worse uh, than a minus 0.1 reading. So the reading economic indicators is not suggesting that a recession is imminent. Uh, Bloomberg, for its part, tracks uh, recession probability. And today, the odds of recession are relatively high. They're 35 percent, which of course means 65 percent chance that we don't have recession. But the interesting thing we find in actually crunching data and numbers is Boy, the last time we had 35% risk of recession, according to Bloomberg, was the fall of 2011, which proved out to be a fantastic time to buy stocks as the S&P was up 30% over the ensuing 12 months. So as a contrarian investor, we really like to see headlines um, where people are, are nervous about recession um, because, again, historically speaking, um, stocks have done very well when recession probabilities are elevated. And if you're thinking, well, yeah, that's that's all fine and dandy, but I still think there's a recession around the corner. Um, the Atlanta Federal Reserve um, every week publishes their forecast of the near-term economic growth. Believe it or not, they are suggesting that we are likely to have 1.8% GDP growth. Again, 1.8% is not zero. It's not great, but it's obviously not recessionary. So. The idea that recession is around the corner, at this moment anyways, is not supported by the evidence that's out there. Yes, the headlines can be scary, but the actual data does not, does not suggest that recession is imminent. And if you consider the Federal Reserve, which is in the business of making economic projections, and obviously uh, we can debate the um, accuracy of the Fed's ability to predict the economy, but the Federal Reserve back at their meeting in September, every quarter they publish their estimates and apologies that this is a little fuzzy, um, but their estimate for GDP growth in 2019 was 2.2%. In 2020 was 2.0%. Again, not great economic growth by any stretch of the imagination, but this is not negative. This is not zero or, or lower. So the Federal Reserve is still suggesting that we're likely to have what I call you know, modest uh, economic growth. I like to say the economy will muddle along. And that's sort of what I think is going to be the case. Now that Fed sta the projection was from September. Um, last weekend, or last Friday, uh, Fed Vice Chair Richard Clarita um, had a speech out. And in that speech, he talked about how the economy is in a good place, the baseline outlook is favorable, and he does acknowledge that there are risks. And a lot of the risks, of course, are related to the trade um, skirmish with China. And obviously, the European economy is, is not exactly booming either. We have the concerns about Brexit and its impact. Um, but generally speaking, the Federal Reserve is on our side. The Federal Reserve is likely to take actions that will um, sustain growth, as you see down here, will act as appropriate to sustain growth, a strong labor market, and a return of inflation to their 2% objective. So the Federal Reserve remains uh, very friendly. The interest rate environment is extraordinarily um, attractive in my mind, and we'll talk a little bit more about interest rates in a bit. But one of the reasons the market tanked here a few weeks back 
um, for one day anyways, we had a big downturn in the market because everybody was concerned about um, an economic statistic called the ISM Manufacturing Index, and it dropped to 47.8, which was a surprise. Nobody expected it to drop that low, and this is a gauge of manufacturing activity in the U.S. And the fascinating thing was that while 47.8 is below the 50 dividing line, which is the division between expansion and contraction in the manufacturing sector or the factory sector, if you look at the actual data from the Institute for Supply Management, who that's what the ISM stands for, they say the past relationship between the PMI, which was uh, 47.8, and the overall economy corresponds to a 1.5% increase in real gross domestic product on an annualized basis. So the scary index that caused people to sell stocks because they were worried that a recession was happening, if you actually just bothered to open up your web browser, you would have seen that, well, 1.5% economic growth is not recession. And more interestingly, for us anyways, as value investors and as data crunchers, we actually looked at that ISM reading and said, okay, what happens when it's 47.8 or lower, meaning that it's you know, indicating recession in the manufacturing um, economy. And we, we crunched all those numbers, looked at value stocks, growth stocks, and the S&P 500. Okay, one year out, what happens? Three years out, five years out, what has happened? So on average, you know, value stocks had had a 26.6% one-year return when you have readings like this. And growth stocks did well too, 22.7. The S&P was about 20%. And then you go three-year numbers, and you can see, wow, these are fantastic returns. So we had a major um, buy signal when the ISM index dropped, and yet the natural reaction of investors was to be nervous and concerned and to potentially even sell their stocks because the media uh, sensationalized this, this reading and said, oh, no, there's a, a recession coming. And there was even some factually incorrect stories um, that I actually helped get corrected because stories said, you know, this, this ISM index indicates recession. And they didn't actually add in the language recession in the factory economy, which, oh, by the way, makes up 11% of the U.S. economy, not, and the other 89% is not in a recession, obviously. So we had a major buy signal, and obviously value did better than growth. And so if you are a student of market history, as we are, uh, boy, that ISM reading uh, looks like a, a big buy signal. Now, to be fair, the number of data points are only 177, and we have had some periods where there have been losses, you know, a 24% decline is the minimum. Well, of course, an 84% advance, I'll take that all day long. And you can see here, even if you go out five years, the worst five-year return for value stocks following readings of 47.8 was 3.2% per year. So anybody who tells you you should sell uh, stocks because the, the economic data is somehow weak um, obviously hasn't actually looked at how stocks perform when you have weak economic data. So again, this is all stuff that we think helps you to navigate through the, the, you know, the ups and downs of the market. And if you can actually have these data points you know, <laughs> at your fingertips, and it's not that hard to get. Um, of course, if you subscribe to our newsletter, we'll talk to you about them all the time. Um, you know, and then the other thing that I think is, is super important is that while the risk of recession is high, what if we actually have a recession? What if we're wrong, John? What if the Federal Reserve is wrong? What if the economists are all wrong and we do have a recession? Well, what happens then? Well, guess what? We can actually crunch those numbers as well. There have been 14 recessions. And of course, you can't predict a recession or you won't know you're in recession until two quarters have gone by because you need two quarters of negative economic growth to, uh, to, for it to be a recession. So you, you can't know it in advance. But if you could, um, here's the, if you look at the recession start dates, here's how stocks have done on the left. Look how value stocks have done in the year before recession started. 10.6% return. Yes, there have been some bad years in there. Of course, there have been some great years in there, too. And so, again, the historical evidence says that even if you knew when a recession was going to start, you shouldn't be selling your stock. Now, having said that, 
The one-year returns aren't that great. A 2.3% average return for value stocks once the recession has begun. And of course, remember, you can't predict when the recession will be, really. <laughs> Economists can't predict it. But if you could, and if I said, well, on average, you're going to get a 2.3% over the next one year in this recessionary environment, it still wouldn't be reason to sell your stocks, especially if you're a long-term investor and you can see these returns. Wow, the three-year return on value has been 44%, again, blowing away the returns on growth. The five-year return, 85%, blowing away returns on growth. And these aren't annualized. These are total returns. And then look at the 10-year numbers, 338% return. So, again, the idea is that you want to actually, you know, look at what has happened historically and not just read or, or make um, moves in your portfolio based on, you know, a headline number that sounds scary in theory, but in reality actually has not been scary, and in some instances has actually been a buy signal. So one of the other things earlier this year that people were freaked out about was the inverted yield curve, because that was supposed to tell us that a recession was imminent, which means that we should be selling our stocks. Well, we just got through talking about how if we have a recession or if data looks recessionary, we still shouldn't sell our stocks. We should actually be buying value stocks. And of course, today we're no longer inverted. But let's look at what's happened the previous times when the yield curve has been inverted. And we've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times previously where we've had a sustained yield curve inversion like we had this year. Well, here's the one year S&P 500 average return, 15%. You know, and you can go out three, five, 10. And obviously, if you held your stocks, you'd have a 3,300% average return for all of these periods. So the idea that a 10-year, two-year yield curve inversion is bad for stocks, I'm, if someone can show me that, please do. But it's not supported by the what has happened historically when the yield curve has inverted. And then again, oh, by the way, um, we've tracked and looked at value and growth stocks um, during these spans where the yield curve has inverted. And we have another value buy signal based on yield curve inversions. Look at the one-year returns on average, 16.2% for value. Again, blowing away growth and blowing away the indexes. Three-year you know, three annualized return, 13%. Five-year annualized return, 17%. Again, yes, there are some bad periods in there. I understand that. But on average, um, a, we've just had a buy signal generated when the the 210 yield curve inverted, despite what you would have heard on television, how this is somehow a bad thing. And, you know, the breaking news that CNBC would flash on their screen that the yield curve inversion meant a recession was around the corner. Obviously, the data tells us otherwise that you shouldn't be bailing out of stocks because there has been a yield curve inversion. Another one of my favorite uh, things that people like to uh, get wrong <laughs> um, is the age of the bull market. Um, I'm still stunned that people somehow think the bull market began in March of 2009, uh, when in 2011, we had a 21.6% uh, peak to trough drop on an intraday basis that year. And I know that the academics will tell us that, uh, yeah, but we only dropped 19.6% on a closing basis. Uh, because somehow the intraday doesn't count. And of course, I like to joke that we can only trade stocks when the market is closed, right? And unfortunately, the academics, uh, I think, don't actually invest or own stocks. They just somehow have their noses in a book. Um, but believe me, there was a decline of more than 20%, which is the definition of a bear market in 2011. And we also had one last year, uh, 2018. The average stock dropped in the Russell 3000 index dropped 24.5%. That's a bear market. If you look at all of these indexes, they were all down 20%. Well, here's the S&P 500 was down 20%. Um, and yet people still don't think that there was a bear market last year. And happily, <laughs> we have proof that there was a bear market because CNBC actually put their breaking news up, S&P 500 enters bear market on December 24th of 2018. And we know that CNBC would never mislead us, so clearly there was a bear market. And it wasn't just CNBC that 
confirm that. Here was Yahoo Finance. S&P 500 enters a bear market. And just in case you didn't know what a bear market was, this fellow here on CNBC told us what it was. What's a bear market? When a stock or commodity sees a decline of 20% or more from a recent high. Well, we were in a bear market. <laughs> and they even said it right here. We quote CNBC.com. So yet somehow um, we still hear that the bull market is too old, that it's somehow over you know 10 plus years old and the average um, you know, bull market doesn't last that long, supposedly. But we had a bear market in 2011. We had one in 2018. And believe it or not, for many stocks, we had one 2014 to 2016. So so next time you hear somebody uh, tell you that the bull market is 10 years old, um, I've got the data right here. Take a picture of it on your computer. Um, I didn't make this up. Um, CNBC had it right there on their website. And there it is. The other thing I, I hear is that everybody is bullish, that People are, are way too optimistic about stocks. They must be um, you know, euphoric about stocks because the, the, you know, we're trading at all-time highs or close to it. Well, in reality, um, people are actually very pessimistic about stocks. Um, each week, the American Association of Individual Investors comes out with their, their bull bear sentiment survey. Um, in the latest week, they actually got a whole lot more bullish, but it, believe it or not, uh, well, now about 13 days ago, um, they were as bearish as they had been uh, in three years. So there isn't a, a euphoria in the marketplace. And then if you look at the chart on the right here, this looks at mutual fund flows. And, out of, and we've had massive outflows. Um, these are in millions of dollars, so almost 11 billion of outflows in domestic equity funds. And it's not just passive or, or active uh, mutual funds, it's also ETFs. And so people are bailing out of out of stocks and buying bonds. And that's nothing nothing different than what's happened really for four plus years. Believe it or not, four hundred and thirty five billion dollars have gone out of domestic stocks and almost a trillion dollars have gone into bonds. So in my mind, the uh, potential um, <laughs> bubble, if you will, is in the uh, bond market. And we need to look no further than the negative yielding debt. You know, thirteen trillion dollars of negative yielding uh uh, debt is insane. I don't know who thinks that buying uh, fixed income uh, with a yield of less than zero makes any sense. Um, we like to say it's reward-free risk. And believe it or not, here's an example of what we mean by reward-free risk, the German 10-year boon. Um, just if we go back to the end of August, um, the yield on the German boon was, believe it or not, minus 0.7%. You know, who would want to invest in something where you're going to be guaranteed to lose 70 basis points a year for the next 10 years? That's insane. Um, and of course, the, <laughs> the the funny story I like to show as well, the boom fell in price uh, over since the end of August, and it's actually dropped 3.56%. Uh, so you lost 356 per, uh, basis points. You know, you were hoping to lose 70, and you lost 356. So in my mind, you quintupled your expected return, right? Because the negatives cancel, minus 3.56 divided by point, minus 0.70. I know it's a silly example, but again, if, if you're hoping to lose money, um, you know, the only way you're going to make money is to find a greater fool, you know, when, when your, your best return is, is from a greater fool, but in a normal scenario, you're just going to lose a little bit. Why do you want to take that risk? How is it that, that in bonds are attractively priced when they have a negative yield. So we think that you know fear can be mitigated by reason. We constantly talk about uh, um, these concepts uh, every week. We we do a market commentary from which uh, this presentation is is drawn. All the material we've been talking about of late, and happily we've you know done very well in our newsletter. Uh, Mark Holbert wrote a nice piece about us in 2017, the little newsletter that crushed the market. And but Mark's moral of the story was it pays to have nerves of steel. Um, I don't think I have nerves of steel, but what I have is is data and facts at my fingertips, which allow you to have the reason to mitigate the fear. You know, just because we you know we we are in this for the long term doesn't mean that the the road isn't bumpy along the way. So it's very helpful to have all of this historical um, evidence. And you know, I, I like to also show that bad stuff happens. Um, this is just since the end of the financial crisis, all the scary things. Remember, we had a flash crash. 
you know, the S&P downgraded U.S. debt back during the bear market in 2011, you know, hurricanes, terrorist attacks. We had an Ebola scare. I mean, all sorts of things, including the Brexit vote. Believe it or not, that was over three years ago. And when I ran this, you know, a couple of days ago, we had a 42 percent increase since Brexit. And I know a lot of people are still sitting on the sidelines waiting for that to play out because somehow that's going to drag down the global stock markets. Well, obviously, it hasn't uh, done that. And just as the Trump victory was supposed to be the end of the world, too, for uh, the equity markets, that hasn't been the case. So the moral of the story, keep calm, carry on. So let's move on to the, uh, the what many people probably came for, which is the listing of undervalued dividend paying stocks. And I think it's important to um, uh, view yourselves as a business owner as, a po as opposed to a trader of pieces of paper. We feel we're investing alongside great companies, but uh, we just want to do it at attractive prices. And the reason we invest in dividend paying stocks, as I said earlier, is that historically they've delivered higher returns than non-dividend paying stocks. So you're investing in an area of the market that has a propensity to outperform. And the in other interesting thing is that dividend paying stocks have been less volatile. Their gyrations, their standard deviation has been lower. So the holy grail for many of investors is higher returns, lower risk. I just gave you the secret right here. Dividend paying stocks have historically given you higher returns and done so with lower risk. So you think dividend payers are attractive, especially today when the yield on the S&P was 1.9% and you compare that to a 1.8% or so yield on the 10-year treasury. Um, stocks are extraordinarily attractive uh, versus where they usually trade historically. You can see the 10-year line has historically been well above the yield on, on stocks, except back here in the financial crisis in 09, which obviously was a great time to buy stocks. Um, back in 2016, we've had similar things where it was a good time to buy stocks, and we have it today. So I think equities are super attractive. And then you think about where your, your other investment opportunities might lie. You know, what else can you do with your money? Well, you can put it in a, a money market account. Uh, I call it the mattress, but you can put it in a money market account and Schwab has a good one that's yielding 1.77% today. Well, back in 2000, you could have got 5% in a money market fund and 6%, well, 5% in 2007, 6% in 2000. So you can't just look at stocks uh, in a vacuum and say, well, gee, we're at a higher end than a P.E. ratio or something like that without considering where else you might put your money. And of course, 1.77 is a lot better than zero, which it was for many, many years. Um, but again, if I could get five or six percent in a quote unquote risk free investment, I might look differently uh, at stocks than if I'm only getting 1.77%. And those dividends, uh, oh, by the way, on stocks historically have increased over time. Look at the number of increases in the S&P 500 versus the decreases. And this is the payout on the S&P 500. So the nice thing about investing in stocks is that your, your income, um, it's not fixed. It could go down, but historically it's gone up. Whereas you invest in bonds, generally speaking, your coupon is fixed. So your yield today might only be 1.9 on the S&P 500. But if the dividends double over the next you know, uh, 10 years, then your, your effective yield might be close to 4% on your initial investment uh, today. And the reason companies can raise dividends is that historically earnings have risen and the market often follows the, the growth of earnings. And earnings, at least on an operating basis, are still expected to grow. Comp uh, this is data from Standard & Poor's their most recent estimates. I know that usually analysts are too high in their expectations, but we are still forecasting growth uh, the rest of this year and into 2020. So we are expecting growth and Bloomberg's forecasting growth out to 2021 at least. So dividends are attractive, but value stocks, as we mentioned earlier, we had a couple of buy signals for value. And you know, value's done very well, including from the time we started our newsletter back in 1977. Value has actually had a 14% annualized rate of return compared to 11% for growth. And I know value's gotten a bad name over the last decade. People somehow think value has done poorly. Um, that value's done just fine. On average, this was through the end of September. We just ran this in our newsletter. But the uh, value indexes were up 11% per year over the last 10 years. Those are fantastic returns. 
especially when you consider what you might have earned on other mark equity markets around the world or on what you might have earned on other investments. So stock value stocks have done very well. Yes, they haven't done as well as growth, but that's one of the reasons they're so attractive today. Believe it or not, value is as attractive uh, today relative to growth as at any time since uh, the tech, uh, tech bubble back in 2000. So value stocks, we've got a lot of buy signals for value. And oh, by the way, value's done just fine over the years, but we, we care about what's going to happen going forward as well. And uh, I like what's, what I see in regard to the odds for value. And we can also look at financial metrics like a price to book value ratio. And you can see this gap or the green line, which is growth uh, and the gap for the, the blue line or purple line, which is value. It's a big wide uh, chasm there, similar to what we had back in 2000, which was the last time that uh, we had these kind of dynamic where growth was so expensive relative to value. And we know that value performed extraordinarily well once the tech bubble burst. Not suggesting the tech bubble is going to burst today, but historically speaking anyways, this, is, this would be a great time to buy value. And it's the same kind of thing with the P-E ratio. Uh, not quite as wide a gap because actually um, many tech companies make money, and believe it or not, we like a lot of tech stocks. Um, but the gap on a P-E basis is wide, and you can also see how the P-E for value is below its, its norm over the last 20-some-odd years. So again, another reason that we would be emphasizing value. And of course, we also like the metrics on our portfolios. Uh, dividend yields are in our 3% on our managed accounts. Um, P-E ratios on a forward basis in the 12 range. We think this is extraordinarily cheap, especially when you think about where we are in interest rates. If I can get a 1.8% 10-year you know, bond yield, or I could get a 3% yield on the stock portfolio, I don't understand why anybody would want to invest in, in bonds, provided, of course, they have a long-term time horizon. And when I, I'm going to give you the, our, our stocks that we like here in a second, but when I look at the value growth uh, conversation, you know, we don't discriminate. We just happen to buy companies that we think are attractively priced. And it doesn't matter if somebody else would categorize them as, as value or growth. But clearly, we tilt toward value. The things in green here are holdings that we have. Um, and obviously, we have a lot more value stocks than we do growth stocks. But you can see Microsoft, Apple, Google, Disney, Amgen. These are all quote unquote growth stocks. And yet, uh, we own them. And uh, Apple and Microsoft are among our two largest holdings. So just because we're value managers doesn't mean we can't have companies that grow. So. I'm going to um, leave this slide up here for the last uh, couple of minutes, and uh, we will see if there are any questions in the few time, uh, the couple minutes we have left. But I'm going to also, since I need to show you my uh, disclosures, I'm going to go back to the, the stock pick, so just uh, bear with me. Um, I do think it's important that you be patient. Um, just because we like something doesn't mean it's going up tomorrow. Um, I really think that this is, uh, we're like the farmer, so we plant our seeds. And once, if you know anything about farming, once you've planted your crops, there's nothing to show for it. Uh, you got to be patient, wait for the rains to come, the sun to shine, and then you harvest, you know, in the fall. So this is a listing of all of the stocks that we are currently recommending for compliance purposes. I have to show that. And then here are our compliance disclosures. So without further ado, I'm going to go back and show you the list. Um, broadly diversified uh, uh, portfolio, we chose stocks, all of which are yielding more than the 30-year treasury, which was 2.3% at the time. You can see this column here is dividend yield, and then you can see where we are P-E ratio-wise, um, very attractively priced in our mind. Um, you know, Again, higher yielding names, but inexpensively priced, and, and we still think these are stocks that have significant appreciation potential to go along with the dividend income we are getting. It looks like I have about uh, one or two minutes left. Uh, I'm not sure if we will have time for any questions, but um, I do certainly appreciate everybody uh, coming out. I'll leave this on the screen, and I will hang out for a minute or two and see if we have questions. But thank you. All right, John. Thank you so much uh, for this fantastic presentation today. We did have a um, question just come in. Um, Barry asks, I watched CNBC halftime money report. Do you think they encourage short-term investment thinking? 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, CNBC is, is not something a long-term investor should pay a lot of attention to. Yes, we do, you know, have it on in our office with the sound down. Yes, if there's some, you know, news event that we need to know about, it's good to have a source to go to to at least hear the news. Um, but, uh, yeah, CNBC is in business to what? To sell advertising. Um, selling advertising to a guy like me who's investing for the next, you know, 5, 10, 30 years, I'm not going to change my investment strategy because of some news event. So um, I think it's it, it can be hazardous to your wealth, and um, I would be very careful about how much financial television I watch. Again, the idea is that, you know, investing should be like watching the grass grow, right? It should be, uh, you know, it shouldn't be exciting. It should be, you know, I'm just plodding along. You know, we're the tortoise and the tortoise and the hare. Um, I know most people want to be the hare, um, but at the end of the day, and as the Hulbert track record for our newsletter shows, um, the tortoise has won the race over the long term. So, so please turn off the volume on CNBC if you have to have it on. Um, frankly, as Al Frank used to say, you know, go to the movies, you know, play with the grandkids. Um, you don't need to watch your portfolio. All right, thank you so much. Uh, one more question popped in. Um, so your newsletter has about 80 stocks listed. I probably own about 30 of them. However, how do you suggest an investor buy among that group of 80? Do they buy all 80 or do they pick and choose according to industry, industry groups? Sure. Well, we, we can believe in broad diversification. We'd have at least 30 of our picks, um, would be preferable. Um, for those who subscribe to our newsletter, they know that we actually publish um, the Prudent Speculator portfolio, which is Al Frank's portfolio that's been going since 1977. So they can literally download that and pop in their dollar amount and do the proportional buys. Of course, there are no commissions today, so it doesn't cost anything to buy 80 stocks. Um, that would be one way. Or they, of course, can um, you know decide, hey, I'd like just like to buy you know two banks and not six banks and they can cherry pick from the list. But, um, you know, given with no commissions these days, um, we would prefer to buy all, all 80 names that are in, say, TPS portfolio. And, uh, you know, we do publish the list of everything that's there. Um, it's on the website. When we uh, make a trade, we announce it to our, our subscribers. Um, same thing with new purchases. So we're very transparent. Um, you know, you can, you can manage your portfolio, um, you know, utilizing the newsletter. Many of our clients, believe it or not, our managed account clients have started off as newsletter subscribers, but then they like the fact that we have the discipline, the patience, and the consistency in implementing the strategy over time. But, uh, yeah, if you have 30, that's great. You're on the right track to being a value investor, um, but uh, 80 is even better. All right, excellent. Looks like uh, we have time for one more here. Um, let's see. The question is, um, what is the best timing or sell signal to sell the sell a stock? <laughs> well, as we like to joke, our, our market our market timing advice has been to buy. Your line didn't go mute. That was a dramatic pause. We're still waiting for that first <laughs> sell signal in forty forty two years. Um, in terms of, of selling a stock, you notice on our screen we have target prices. Um, and so we would sell a stock if it, if it reached our target price or got close to our target price. But more importantly, um, we're always looking at, at the universe of stocks. So when we find something we like better, um, every stock in our portfolio is fighting for its position. So that would be a time we would sell something as if we found something we liked better. Um, or it reached its target price, or something had changed in our investment thesis. Um, but investment theses or thesi should not change just because the market decides they like something or don't like something. Um, you know, we like to tell a story. We bought Boeing uh, three or so years ago um, at about $118, and the very next day they announced an accounting issue, and it was $104. So we looked like a bunch of uh, idiots for, you know, having a stock go down 11% in a day. But it didn't change our investment thesis. We always knew that they had issues in terms of how they account for the building of aircrafts because they're a long process. Um, and so we held our stock and happily we were able to sell it over $300, um, you know, three years later. So the moral of the story is don't let the market drive your investment thesis. Let the, the state of the company um, be the 
determining factor. And uh, don't think that the investing public somehow knows more than you do um, about evaluating businesses over the long haul. Because stock prices will gyrate. You know, remember it was two weeks ago we were selling off because recession was imminent. Well, now the recession may not be imminent. You know, we were worried about Brexit. We were worried about the Trump of victory. We we're worried about every everything. And you know, it's very hard to actually um, you know pull the trigger on buying stocks because there's always something to worry about and always a, a reason you know investors can find not to not to buy. And so the beauty is that you can you know that market stock market is is a positive sum game. Businesses become more valuable over time. It's not a casino where the odds are stacked in your favor. They're only stacked against you if you, uh, you know, trade too frequently. All right. Well, that looks like uh, has us at about time. Um, John, I appreciate it so much. Money Show, thank you so much. Brilliant presentation today. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody's time as well. Thank you. Thank you.